Hello Gems! Welcome to another episode of TRs in Tech. I'm your host, Shelly Benhoff, and today I'm talking to Angela Andrews about getting started in tech. She is an AWS Certified Solutions Architect and co-host of the Compiler Podcast. We talked about how tech is not just development, the importance of representation, and getting your first job. Without further ado, on to the episode. Hey, Angela. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Why, thank you, Shelly, for the invite. It is an honor. Thank you. Thank you. And I love your tiara. For people who are listening to this as a podcast, Angela is wearing a beautiful tiara that even has a purple stone on it, which is the color of the show. (laughs) I dressed for the occasion. You did. You're the first one. I've I've always said that hopefully in the future, when this takes off and I have like money, I'll send all of the guests a tiara to awesome. wear. That would be yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you have a very uh, cool story with your tech journey starting as, you know, help desk support to a cloud practitioner, a solution architect, I would love to just hear how you got started, um, any struggles you've had along the way, go. (laughs) I would love to share my story because this, my journey made me who I am right now. Um, I started um, on a help desk. So even before then, I was a I was a I was a secretary for a vice president of an insurance company, and I you know it's a pretty big company, so they have a lot of training where you can take whatever like whatever suited your fancy. So they had a lot of you know hardware, software, networking training. So I just I was young. I started taking all of this cool training, and you know the VP was he was a programmer by trade. So he was a technical person. He was in leadership, but he was a technical person. And he saw, he noticed that I'm, you know, taking on more and more responsibilities. Like if people have, you know, they need memory upgrades, you know, I wouldn't just buy the memory. I would install it in their systems. I started becoming just more and more self-sufficient. And he took note of it and was like, you're really getting a hang of this. And, you know, we have, we had another location. He said, would you mind being their support person? You know, so it was, you know, it was a longer drive. Unfortunately, Um, I did it for a couple of months and the drive got me. And I said, I'm going to find my first help desk job. And lo and behold, I found my first help desk job. And that was to me, that was the, that was the boot camp for learning technology from that point forward. If you think about the help desk, you're sitting there and people from all over the, the world, because this, this was an international company, are calling you with multiple different technical issues. And you have to talk them through, you know, triage, figure out what their problem is. Um, it could be networking, it could be software, it could be hardware, it could be permissions. It can, so you're, you're literally taking apart multiple pieces of what someone's technical problem can be. And if you can solve it, great. If you can't, you can forward it on to someone, but you're also triaging, you're documenting your work that you've done, you know, the Q and A that you've had between you and your customer, and you're setting up whoever gets this call next um, for a much smoother interaction with the customer. Exactly. Yeah. That was like the, to me, that is the best way. I learned so much about networking. I learned about different softwares. I learned about just technology in general by being on the help desk. Yes. Absolutely. I, I've told you that I also started on the help desk, um, you know, right out of college. I had a hard time finding a job, but not as hard as people have it now. Um, mm. cause I'm old enough. It was kind of just starting, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so Same. I, I actually had one customer who constantly had problems, um, with programming. He wasn't a programmer and mm. I ended up helping him. And that's how I got into programming help desk. Wow. Yep. 
<laughs> that is impressive. Now that story you don't hear very much. You That's hear true. the networking, the software, the whatever, the up cloud, whatever you want to call it. But to get into programming from Help Desk, like that's an interesting story right there. It was interesting because his problem was that he had this um, Microsoft Access application, you know, and um, someone else had written it. He took it over. He wasn't a dev. He was trying to learn access as well. And so I was not only helping him solve his problems, I was teaching him how to solve them himself as well. Got it. Got it. Wow. So you probably learned a lot from each other, right? We did. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. He loved me and he was so sad when I left, but I was like, you know, I... I'm going to be a programmer. Obviously, this is what I want to do. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So um, after help desk um, or how was your transition from help desk to solutions architect? Ooh, okay. You jumped the gun there. So to get off the help desk, right? That was a, that was a journey in a, in it of itself. I was working at another company and I was, they hired me as their first real employee. It was a break off from another company and um, they needed someone to do their help desk. So I, I applied and because I was the only person that they had hired after people had kind of moved over from this other company, they needed me to do not just help desk. I had to do, you know, punch down for phones and, and jacks in the office. And so that's where I started to learn a little bit about, um, you know, PBXs and um, networking and, you know, you know uh, patching switches and running cable and things like that. So once I had done that for quite a, a while, you know, I started moving, they started hiring more and more people. So then I started becoming more, I was a network administrator, which was really networking and systems administration. This was back in um, Exchange 5.5 and, you know, NT4, I am showing my age. No, um, but it I was- am- I'm the same age. (laughs) Right. So this was when it it was back then. And so that's when it just transitioned from the help desk into systems and networking. Oh, right. And it was so, it it happened so gradually and organically because I had learned and done so much. And then they started hiring people specifically for help desk. It was just like, well, you've been here longer, longer than anyone. You have to move into this role more permanently. So um, that's how, that's how I became a, they called it a network admin, admin, but it was, it was a, a bit of networking, more systems administration. Okay. And then from there, it was systems administration for, I don't know, almost 20 years. <laughs> wow. I had no yeah. idea. That's amazing. I will you know, admit that I know very little about networking. The most that I've done last year, I was having Wi-Fi issues at home and I researched and implemented Mocha in my house. And so it's a closed circuit, like, and so my connection is not shared outside of my house. And that, that just, that fixed it. Awesome. And you know what? You know what? Necessity. The mother, the mother invention. That's how you figure things out because you need to. What else? Exactly. What else is there? You're really forced by necessity to learn and stretch yourself. Exactly. And it was interesting to study and learn. I, you know, hadn't really touched any kind of networking before. Um, so it helped. Yeah. <laughs> It was great. Well, awesome. Congratulations on that. Thank you so much. So yeah, um, in in terms of your um, overall like experience with your networking skills and all of that, how did that lead to um, programming and solutions and Amazon Web Services and cloud, Red Hat wow. and all that? <laughs> so I've, I've taken, you know, sys- systems administration was my job. That was my career. That's what paid the bills. I had gotten interested in programming 
And um, I had taken some web development classes and wound up getting a web development certificate at the college that I worked at. Nice. And I wanted to take it a step further. So I had um, started a full stack coding boot camp. So this was just a hobby for me. This was something that I like to do um, on the weekends. You know, I had I was volunteering for this nonprofit that would teach, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, WordPress, and I would either, you know, TA a class. I may have only, I think I may have only taught like one class, but I was a TA and I was taking their courses and I was learning so much. And I wanted to, the, the systems administration community was not very open to me. I, it, it felt very closed. I didn't know another sysadmin that looked like me. <laughs> Yep. in my career and I would go to conferences and I just felt kind of alone like there was yeah. where are all the black women like I was literally never I would go to VM world I would go to uh, Microsoft Ignite I'd go to all these conferences and just you know be sitting in a room and it's like wow there's no even the speakers there's no representation and it just felt really closed the coding community on the other hand was much more open. Mm, good. There were much more women, especially in my city. Um, this this arm of this mon- nonprofit was really big. This was like the the headquarters was here, so it was a lot of uh, you know they had done a lot of the groundwork here and had moved into other cities. So I just was like, this is a career choice. I think I want to become a developer. So I'd gone to this full stack coding boot camp for six months, and at the end of it. I decided I was a much better sysadmin than I was a programmer. So <laughs> never got a developer job. I got a, a newer uh, sysadmin job. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's when I started getting into AWS. So it was serendipitous. I think learning to program at that level just made me a much more attractive candidate. Right. There you go. Mm-hmm. Um, and not everybody can say that, you know, can I still write a little bit of Python or JavaScript? I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, if if I was forced to, <laughs> if I was forced to, I'm sure I could figure it out. But that's how I got, that's how the coding bug hit. And I think how I became a solution architect was, I was in this program called um, Red Hat Accelerators. And it's a, it's a your, your customers of Red Hat, but you get to learn about Red Hat technologies. So I'm a Red Hat accelerator and um, a fellow accelerator had just gotten a job at Red Hat. And he, the minute he got there, and when I say minute, I'm not being facetious. He said, girl, you need to come work at Red Hat. And I was just like, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good, like I had just gotten this job after boot camp. I was comfortable. I loved my job. N- yeah. n- not, a lot of people can't say that. That's I true. My job. Especially I, in tech. <laughs> I love my job. I love my amazing. teammates. I loved where I worked. I loved everything. Of course, it had its issues, but I thought to myself, you know what? This is probably where I'm going to spend the rest of my career. And I was okay with that. Seriously, that's how comfortable I was. And he pushed and poked and prodded. And long story short, now I'm a red hatter. (laughs) (laughs) He wooed you. I love that. Oh, goodness. Did he like, (laughs) did he send you like a basket of mini muffins or anything? No, but he did get that signing bonus after I was here for three months. He got a couple bucks on my behalf. So um, he has since taken me out to dinner. So, oh, that's that's, good. Nice. (laughs) Nice for him. (laughs) Um, I want, I want to circle uh, to the, the conferences because Uh I've, I've been there. I have seen all of the speakers are white men. (laughs) There might be a woman, but who's also white, you know, and I just, the representation issue is very, very important to me. I um, have gone out of my way to try to like recruit plural site authors of color. Mm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And it just, I, I feel, um, like I, I don't have your experience at all, but I have traveled the world and I have been a person in a room of people who are completely different from me. 
And I know that that is uncomfortable. And I also have been in a room of people completely different from me who all hate Americans, (laughs) which was very uncomfortable for me. Mm. They would say things right to my face, like, you're so American, you know, something like that. And I'd just be like, I don't think that's okay. But I was too young to like speak up or say anything. Um, What do you think would help to change that? What support is needed um, from everyone? Well, part of it happens at the the C-suite in a lot of these companies. The fact that we all work for companies where 90% of leadership looks exactly the same, white male. Mm -hmm. Um, When you when that is the organization in most organizations, I'm not even singling one out, but you can look at all of these major or minor technology companies and you look who's at the head of it and you say, okay, so this is what tech is. And then everyone's talking diversity and, you know, we want to diversify our, our pools and things like that. And, you know, when you get down a level and you look at management underneath, it's still the same. And then you go down a little bit further and you may see a few more, yeah. you know, represent um, more cultures and uh, genders and uh, represented. It's that is to me, that's kind of where it starts. But where it begins is how are we training or onboarding um you know, women, uh, minorities, um, people with different abilities. How are we enabling a diverse, more diverse set of people into technology? How are we doing that? To me, it, it seems as we're not reaching people young enough, right? Um, we think about college, you know, that's the people's first, you know, first or second foray, maybe high school. But you know, you think about where technology is in a young person's life now, you have some three-year-olds who are technologically savvy and can operate their Alexa and they can operate their pad, iPads and whatever. So they've been exposed and, you know, where are, now are they curious? So how do we get people curious? That's, that's the thing. And how do we keep them curious? Think about back in the seventies and when, you know, most women were, most programmers were women. Right. I know. Right. And then how did that switch when, you know, people were getting forced out of it for one reason, personal or professional reason or another? Three things. The earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. Exposure is important. Um, Representation is important. So having, you know, your your technology teacher kind of look like you or, you know, bring, bring that image to you at a really young age matters. Mm -hmm. And, um, three support because, you know, support in any field is important, not just technology, but knowing that the support is there when things get hard or when things get tough, you have someone, a sounding board who's been in your shoes, who can listen to you. Those three things I think are super important. Yet I talk about at the top, but Mm -hmm. cultivating a whole new generation of people who are interested in technology in such a way that they know how to create, they know how to um, build, they're, they're curious and inquisitive and they stick with it because we're all inquisitive to a certain extent, like something will cool and will catch our attention, but can it keep our attention? Can it, can it, can it mold us? Can it support us? Can it, you know, do we feel comfortable in this space? All those things are super important. And I know to some that might not sound important, but it really is when you're not valued or you don't feel like you're seen or there's not another person in the room look look, that looks like you or in that space you know it's really hard to figure out well what's your what's next what do you do next when there's nothing there that you can kind of um, strive toward right Um, so there's you know a multifaceted problem but if we're really serious about any change we have to start doing things, you know, at these grassroots levels and at these top levels in these companies. And it has to be more than lip service. 
Exactly. I was just thinking I've worked for so many companies. So Black History Month, um, when this comes up, first of all, you can support Black people and other marginalized groups 24-7, 365. Um, But I hate to see when companies use their Black employees to like promote their brand during Black History Month and they're not management. They're always just, you know, Mm -hmm. employees. And I'm like, where are your Black executives, you know? Like, (laughs) and where are they the other 11 months of the year? Exactly. (laughs) Just trying them out for February and ta-da. And and that's just supposed to fly. Exactly. Well, at least you get a whole month. I stutter. There's one day in October, International Stuttering Awareness Day. It's one day. One whole day. Our president stutters, you know? Exactly. Like, why isn't it like a national holiday? Well, whatever. It shouldn't be. I, that. I see, to yeah. your point, to your point, that type of representation does matter. It does. You know? Absolutely. I I spent my whole childhood and high school um, hiding the fact that I was smart and hiding the fact that I was a nerd, you know? And I was like popular and I, um, you know, I was in drama and musical theater and stuff like that, but nobody ever knew that I played with computers in mm. my spare time. I felt like I had to hide that until I was in college. And then even then I wasn't really accepted. I, I went to a really small college in Maryland and um, there were five girls in, in my CS program, wow. five out of like maybe a hundred or 200 or so. Like it was, it was small, but still, you know? Um, Yeah. And it was just, I don't know why I ever thought or I never thought I might have problems finding jobs or I might be talked to in a way that I don't like at work. And think about your time in high school where you weren't allowed to show the world your passion, that you were a nerd, that you were into technology and you felt that you had to hide that. Totally. And then people were stunned. Why is that? Why? What climate we, do we live in where a student has to suppress a part of who they are? I think you know it's what I more mean? a woman has to suppress yeah. who she is. Yeah. Because and in your, yes, definitely. In your case, it's like, why did you have to do that? Yeah. I, I used to watch movies like old old school movies where women were you know only meant to be beautiful to be someone's wife and to have children so I had Mm -hmm. it ingrained in my head very early on that I had to find a rich husband and you know be taken care of wow that changed I've been the breadwinner during my whole relationship with my husband we've been (laughs) together for 16 years you know, so at least in college, I finally realized who I was, you know, good, good, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, an, a still a formative time in your life. Right. And you were, were you were able to grow and, and show that side of yourself. But, you know, I, I don't want that for any person where totally. they have to hide their interests and, you know, what, what drives them and their passion and, we shouldn't because that's how you lose interest. You know, when you have to hide something so long, it's like, you know, it's there, but you're putting on all this other stuff so everybody else can see it. And that's what, that's what gets the response. That's what people are, you know, they say, Shelly, you know, she's the, she's the dramatic actress and this is what we want from her. And this is what she shows us. But, you know, you're really giving up a part of yourself when you, when, when anyone has to do that, when anyone has to do that, it's unfortunate. So we have to make it comfortable. We have to make it comfortable just being who we are and, and not having to hide that. And, you know, for all the smart, you know, young women out there that even think about, that they have to shrink themselves 
for whatever reason, because it's not popular, because, you know, it's not necessarily a girl's thing, air quote, um, just dead that, like, don't even, if that, if that thought ever pops into your head, know it's the wrong thought and yeah. keep it moving. That's the, the, it's the opposite of how it should be. And, you know, kudos for those who can stand in their, in their faith and, you know, hold on to that. But I get what you're saying. It's, you know, who, nobody, it's not cool to be the nerd. <laughs> yeah. Or it didn't used to be, it is now, you know, because we, we made it cool. <laughs> Yeah. You're we're welcome. The ones, we're the ones that made it cool. Yeah. You're welcome, Gen Z. Exactly. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. yeah so oh know. my goodness. Yeah. Um uh, I had something on the top of my head that I, I can't remember. It'll um, come back. It'll yeah. come back. It'll absolutely come back. Um <laughs> tell tell me the story behind your name Scooter Phoenix. I love this story. I love this story. So back in, I want to say 2000, I uh, started getting interested in riding motorcycles and you couldn't tell. I knew I wanted a motorcycle. I knew it. It was in there. I started taking the motorcycle safety course. Um, I bought a motorcycle and I started looking around like, wow, I wonder if there's like groups where folks, you know, can ride together. Cause I didn't know anyone personally who rode motorcycles. I was just out there on my own saying, I'm going to ride a motorcycle. So I found this motorcycle. It was a woman's motorcycle club. And, nice. you know, it was, it was a small club of a couple of women and, you know, I had met them and I had joined this club. And there was one, there was, there's always a mean girl, right? There's always a mean girl. There was a yeah. mean girl in this club. And I had a 500 CC bike. Everybody else in my club had 600, 750, 1000 CC bikes. I had a 500. It's my first bike. Give me a break. So this woman would proceed to call my bike a scooter. Now, of course, this is a motorcycle. What's faster than a scooter? She was like, you and that scooter, we always have to wait for you in that scooter always on that scooter hurry up on that scooter so this is this is literally her talking about me and then at some point it didn't bother me anymore nice. and other people started calling me scooter so 20 plus years later my name is still scooter now that's the <laughs> scooter part the phoenix part came where she was the mean girl and we had all gotten sick of her like we're tired of you bullying us and you know you're not the boss of us so we all quit the motorcycle club. Oh my God, and all we of all you? Quit and left her. And wow. we started a, a woman's sport bike club called the Fiery Phoenix. Nice. So I am Scooter Phoenix. So everyone's <laughs> last name is basically Phoenix. Okay. And we, I'm going to show you a picture of my group, but everyone's <laughs> was something Phoenix. So that's I how that. I've been Scooter Phoenix for about 20 plus years. That's and, amazing. Um, it's stuck. It's, people still call me scooter to this day yeah like I I wasn't sure if would I messaged you if I should call mm -hmm. you scooter or Angela and I, I just went with scooter because yeah. and yeah. you know what I responded didn't I yes <laughs> yes you did <laughs> yeah so that was great yeah I think it's interesting how groups of women you know just like you said there's always one mean girl I just I've I've had like an entire episode about this, about how mm. we, um, as women, we are like raised to compete against each other, compete for men, compete for attention from men, compete for husbands, all have to do with men and pleasing men. Oh my God. Like, Isn't this that really needs to stop. <laughs> Why is that even a thing? I don't know. I'm, it's just so ingrained into culture from, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Our entire um, way of life is literally pleasing men. Like that's, <laughs> that's the crux of everything. And it just, I, I feel like um, we're having all of these, you know, movements and trying to undo a lot of this um system you know mm -hmm. and uh 
people are always like, why fight against it? You know, I because that's rather, what we do. I would rather die fighting than join them. Than exactly. join evil. Like N- nothing good comes from not standing up. Just look at the history of civilization. Yeah. Standing up and saying this is enough has caught has been the catalyst for so much change, not in just our country, but across the globe. That's what we do. That's what we do. Right. And it's, I'm, I'm so sad that I did not stand up for myself for a very long time. Like this whole um, thing, my personality coming out and everything wasn't until uh, 2019, probably. Mm, okay. Yeah. Like I, I literally just wouldn't, you know, I didn't feel comfortable being myself around people because I was afraid that they would judge me, you know, and I think a lot of people feel that way. <laughs> they do because people are going to judge you no matter what you're doing, no you matter what my a- therapist says. <laughs> exactly. People are going to judge you. You can be the, the, the shrinking violet in the corner and minding your business and not trying to make, you know, waves. Someone's judging you. There's not, there's not an instance in our lives where there's not some sort of judgment being passed on us, but that's okay. Because if we can be comfortable with that, you know, that someone's judging us, it doesn't make us, it doesn't break us. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Right. And if we just go with that, with that mindset, okay, I'm being judged next. Now what? (laughs) Now that we've gotten rid of that and I don't have to concern myself with it. Um, it's easier to say than to do, but just know that there's nothing we can do that will not suffer the judgment of someone else. Yeah, Um, absolutely. It's really, um, hard. And like you said, it's, it's not easy. I think it becomes easier with age. Like I, I tell people after I turn 40, these are my fuck off forties. Like, yes. Okay. (laughs) Let me tell you about being 40 and I'm five seconds from 50. So I really, I'll be 50 January. I just turned 49. I actually thought you were younger than me. (laughs) Everybody thinks I'm well, I want to say that it's my youthful exuberance that (laughs) it's your skin too. Thank like, you. It's beautiful like, skin with no lines. Yeah. Thank you. That's, I mean, it's a blessing. Thanks mom. Um, <laughs> it's a blessing, but I really, the older I got, the less I gave a F. Like I was like, why? And I think about you just to your point, you think about all the time you wasted where you were just so insecure and you, you, you didn't want to speak up and you, you didn't have that voice and you weren't comfortable making mistakes and be, you know, whoa, the, when that light bulb went off, I just feel so much lighter now. I it's don't like concern, yeah, it is a weight. Lifted. And we mm-hmm. don't realize that we put this weight on our shoulders at a very young age yep. where we're, we're, we don't want to be judged and we don't want to be thought of as different or we, and we put this on and we carry it around with us. And then we watch the world around us go on and be judged and screw up and get a pass and everybody dust themselves off and get back up. And then we're just like, you learn, you see it. And then you realize I do not have to put up with this crap. And you just, you just brush it off. And I love it. I love the freedom that my age has brought me. I wish I could have warned my younger self that this is what you should be doing sooner. Um, I love the fact that I'm, I'm coming across these young women nowadays that are no, realizing this in their 20s. Like, imagine how badass they're going to be when they get my age. Like, oh, yeah. They, are, they have <laughs> grabbed it by the horns. They're not going to let this, you know, the, you know, the sins of the father, this, you know, they're, not, they're not letting that burden them. I love just the just I don't the exuberance like people are so more much more confident like you're on Twitter you see how these oh, these yeah. millennials are just like buck wild and just so more much more confident than I could have ever been at that age but you know I what? learned a lot from them there's something to be said for that exactly. absolutely I I've learned so much I like um 
there are so many people who call things out and like post the name of a person that you should block. And I'm, I'm often connected to them and I just Uh haven't, you know, noticed. Right. And in, in the olden days, I would probably just stay connected because I wouldn't want to upset them. Upset. Exactly. Uh Because I spent my entire life making other people comfortable. Uh People pleasers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was the worst. Uh Yeah. 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 And I, like you said, nowadays, I love how these young people are just, as the kids say, they're not with the shits. Like they're (laughs) not putting up with this nonsense anymore. And, you know, I love that. Think about how much better your you, that having that freedom for much longer allows uh, affords you in your life, right? And not just professionally, but personally as well, right? Yeah. So, right. You said you know when forty came, it happened for us. I get that, but to see it happening so much sooner, yeah. I I love it. I love it. It should happen way way sooner because I yeah. I was even in management and I was still a people pleaser and I was literally hired because I was a yes person Mm -hmm. and I didn't realize this until they fired me you know (laughs) and then I was like lesson learned yeah but I I feel like for me I'm so untethered now because I work for myself I don't have to I don't you know no one's gonna tell me to delete a tweet (laughs) Exactly. The freedom. Awesome. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. It's, it's been quite the journey. Yeah. It's been crazy. Um, yeah. So like, we're kind of talking about how we, um, grew balls, (laughs) how we figured (laughs) things out later, but what, um, advice would you have for, younger people who are, who are just starting out in tech? Mm. Whew, that's a, that's a big question, but, and I, I, I've gotten to, a, you know, help a lot of folks who are just getting started in tech. So I was a, a, a teaching assistant and substitute teacher at a, a cybersecurity boot camp. Right. So these are, you know, 20 somethings, a lot of career changers or whatever. So these are people getting started in tech. And the advice that I would always give them, and you know, tech is a huge thing, this umbrella. We're, I'm speaking very broadly, but these were people who were in a cybersecurity boot camp. And to them, I would say, you know, if you're going to be interested in, and this was cybersecurity, if you're going to be interested in this, what do you think your key skill sets are? You know, and everyone's talking about, you know, capture the flag and, you know, command and control. And they're talking about all this other stuff. And I was like, okay, let's take it back a bit. Networking, learning networking is probably one of the most important skills you're going to need in cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. What's the other one? You know, I, I, this was, you know, me being the teacher for lack of a better word. And um, another one is learning Linux, right? Mm. You're tapping up about your Kali Linux and all this, but, you know, do you know anything? What's an, what's an LVM? You know, the difference between that, you know, how do you format an LVM? Like, so I would push them like you, you want to jump into this security arena. That's awesome. That's great. But there's a thing called fundamentals. And if you don't build those fundamentals, you're not going to understand a lot of the underpinnings that happen um, with the tools, with the, the vulnerabilities, with the things that are coming down your pipe. So, you know, for people in, in cybersecurity and security in general is a really huge um, uh, sector, but for those people, and not just those people, but if you're trying to get into cloud, a lot of people want to be in cloud. A lot of people want to be in DevOps. You, you hear these buzzwords. Um, if you don't know networking, how can you do anything in the cloud? If you That's don't understand Linux, Linux runs the cloud. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. What are so those those two, <laughs> who anyone who will listen to me. <laughs> you're trying to get into this cloud DevOps space, cybersecurity, what the heck? If you don't know networking in Linux, you better go back and figure it out. Those, mm-hmm. are, those are my two. Um, being on a help desk, like people are looking for that first job, you know, what's that first job? Yes, you can go and be a, you know, a junior developer or whatever, but 
developers, that's not the only thing in tech. Mm -hmm. And if you're on Twitter, you hear when people talk about, I want to get into tech, they literally are talking about becoming a developer. Yeah, that's true. And that's not, that is not, that's not all tech. That is not all tech. Yeah. So to those, you know, if you want to write code, that's awesome. That's great. I totally get it. But that's not all tech is, mm -hmm. you know, um, more and more roles are becoming tech that we never thought they were tech in the past. So you think about people who are marketing a particular product. Think about people who market, I don't know, um, a product any at any company. I'm think, say if it's your favorite API company, right? And you have people that are marketing that. They write the documentation for it. They they plan the conferences. They plan the 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 press releases. They're talking about all these things, you know, around this product. We used to call that marketing. That's literally a tech role now. And yeah. I didn't know that until the past couple of years, where you can be a marketer but you need to have a technical bent, right? Totally. So these, these roles, if most companies are now tech companies because they have some sort of technology that they have to, that runs their business or that is their business. So they have to hire folks that are, that are versed in technology. What does that mean? It means a plethora of things. It, it is the networking. It is the security. It is the help desk. It is the documentation. It is, you know, um, I don't want to, uh, the date, the DBAs, the database people. It is, you know, front end. It is back end. It's, it's so huge. And then, of course, it's the cloud. Well, what do you know about the cloud? You know, do you know Linux? Do you know networking? Don't get me started. Um, but what, you know, what is cloud? A cloud is just someone else's computer. Well, you have to know, understand hardware to a certain extent. If you're talking about how many CPUs and how much memory to put into an instance, um, understanding the underpinnings, I think it's really, really important. So, wherever, you know, people are trying to break into tech, understand that it is such a vast, um, uh, I want to call it, it's, it's just a, it's a vast um, thing. It's a, it's so much involves tech nowadays. You have to be a little bit more explicit. Yeah. And with that, that's where this, this, the discovery happens. When you learn more about it, you're going to find these little pockets that you didn't even realize that would be considered a job in tech. There's nothing wrong with becoming a developer. I spent a lot of good money learning to become a developer and I don't regret it for a second. Absolutely. Um, don't regret it for a second. Um, but that's not all there is. So I gave you my two tips, you know, <laughs> learning networking and Linux are, you can write your own check that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. Tech does pay very well. So it's probably why a lot of people <laughs> want to get into it. I don't, blame, yeah. and I don't blame them. No. I don't either. It's, you know, you can make a good amount of money in tech. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Can you believe that we're out of time? I'm so incredibly sad. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> I am so sad. <laughs> I will, I will have to have you back, but, um, before we go, can you yes. tell us where, um, can people connect to you? Do you have any upcoming uh, speaking engagements, yes. podcasts, social wow. media? I would love to. So I am on Twitter a lot, probably more than I should be. And my Twitter handle is at Scooter Phoenix. That's who I am. Um, I am also host of Red Hat's newest podcast called Compiler. So if you go to compilerpodcast.com, uh, you can see our past episodes. You can get our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts from. And any speaking engagements, not that I know of, but I'm sure Red Hat Summit is in the spring. And I was host of Red Hat uh, Red Hat Summit, which is my company's annual tech conference. Um, I may be doing something at Summit. This is me putting it out there. No one has <laughs> asked me to do anything for Summit. I'm sure they would welcome it. But yeah. I you know, if they need another host for Red Hat Summit next year, uh, this year, I would definitely jump on it. So um, nothing, nothing. Just see me on Twitter. I post a lot about self-care and taking care of yourself. And 
I love memes. So there you go. <laughs> yes, you do. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your time. And it was great to talk to you for the first time. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thank you, Shelly, for asking me and extending the invitation. I appreciate it. <laughs> sure. If you want to support us, please like, subscribe, and share this episode with your fellow gems. Let me know in the comments what other topics you would like me to cover and follow TRs and Tech on social media. Thanks for watching or listening and have a great day.